you can open your Bible to Second Peter chapter or First Peter chapter two, if you would. And if you need a copy of the notes, you raise up your hand. Somebody in the back will appear with those. Okay, we got everybody covered. First Peter two. I'll start reading in verse one. I'll give you time to get there, and I will start reading in verse one. Read through a <clears throat> a few of these verses, and then. We will pray, and then we will get right to where we're going tonight. Verse 1 reads as follows. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And if so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious to whom coming is unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believeth he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner, and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, which should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light which in time past were not a people, but now, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Let us pray. Father, tonight, Lord, we come to this study again. One verse we shall examine tonight. Lord, it is a verse that is just filled and overflowing with spiritual truth and encouragement for anybody that is going through a time of difficulty, any time, anybody especially that is going through a time of persecution, when, Lord, they have been uh, rejected by people, uh, cast out, cast down, uh, viewed as maybe the outcasts of society, Lord, this verse is uh, filled with a special meaning for those that are in that very state. So, Lord, use this tonight to encourage us and at the same time to challenge us. And we'll thank you for what you accomplished. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So before I get you to the paper, uh, I, wanted, I always like to try to go back and kind of think like the readers are thinking, the ones that Peter is writing to. They have, they are, they were hated before the, uh, before the fires of Rome were ever started. Uh, they were hated for many reasons. They were blamed for being cannibals because of, in the communion service, they talked about eating the flesh and drinking the blood. And so they were blamed for, for being cannibals. They were, they were hated because some of the Roman women had come to know Christ as Savior. And so, they were uh, they were blamed for uh, dividing the Roman families, and they talked about uh, a time whenever the world would burn. Uh, they talked about the end time events when when everything in this world would would burn up, and so when the when the fires of Rome started, and when they got blamed for those fires, they, the people were just looking for an excuse to persecute the Christians, and so that was kind of the open door. But what I want you to understand is that they were made to feel like the low life of society because of being followers of Christ. They were looked down upon, they were, uh, they were the outcasts, they were not viewed as important people by any means. And I don't care who you are, after a while that that works on you if you're underneath that, if you hear that over and over again, and that's the treatment that you get within a society or even within a family, that works on individuals. And it drives them into depression oftentimes, and even further than that. 
the verse that we're going to look at tonight with that in mind would have had a tremendous amount of meaning to these individuals a tremendous amount of meaning and we shall see that tonight it, uh, this whole section uh, is meant for the intent of encouraging these people that have been for lack of a better way to say it beat down through persecution and so Peter's words are intended to lift them up and that's what the verse is going to do that we're going to look at tonight let me get you to your paper here's what it says last week in our study of first Peter we were looking at Jesus as the living stone uh, watch 2 4 here's what it says to whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed indeed of men but chosen of God and precious that's the verse we focused on let me come back to your paper the words to whom coming actually mean to keep coming that's in the present tense to whom coming to to who you keep coming to and so I have here we're constantly to be coming to Jesus because he is and these are several things that we looked at number one the chief cornerstone of the church Isaiah 28 16 says this therefore thus saith the Lord God behold I lay in Zion a foundation stone a tried stone a precious cornerstone a sure foundation he that believeth shall not make haste in Ephesians 2 19 and 20 it says now therefore you're no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the Apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone so last week we talked about that and I don't want to go too deep back into that because we already examined that but is a is the chief cornerstone a cornerstone in a building was the stone which was laid first which the rest of the building was built off of that stone was squared it was leveled it was plumb everything was measured against the, the cornerstone that's the idea with Christ as we go through life we keep coming to him because we measure our lives up against his life he's the one that we measure ourselves against not we don't find somebody in life that we consider ourselves much better than that individual and measure ourselves against them we measure ourselves against Christ he is the one that that keeps us where we need to be by us measuring our lives against him so that was one thing we come to him because he is the chief cornerstone of the church Number two, we come to him because he is the rock of security. Psalm 61, 1 through 4 says this. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I, will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Psalm 18, 2 and then 31 and 46 say this the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my God my strength in whom I will trust my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower for who is God save the Lord and who is a rock save our God the Lord liveth and blessed be my rock let the God of my salvation be exalted Christ is the rock of security as we talked about with fathers this morning there has to be a solid foundation in order to build a godly family and I say this that in our lives in each one of our lives there has to be a solid rock for a foundation and Christ is that rock that we can cling to and that we hold to and that we plant our feet upon and then when the storms come and the and the winds blow we are not swayed about all over the place but instead we have this rock that we are latched on to that we cling to in the midst of those difficult times number three we come to him because he's the rock of refreshment Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 10 3 and 4 he said and and speaking of Israel and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ we went back to the book of Exodus last week and we looked at the fact that when Israel came through the wilderness they were in a dry and barren land and they needed refreshment you and I live in a dry and barren world spiritually speaking and so there there we in our lives we need a constant refreshing and we get that from Christ as we come to his word so that's why to whom coming to keep coming to constantly present tense be coming to the living stone 
to come to this rock of refreshment, this, this chief cornerstone, this rock of security. We continue to come to him. We continue to seek him because he has more and more for you and I. Let me go on. Now as we move on, Peter is going to continue his thought as he provides encouragement to his readers who are being persecuted for their faith in Christ. And so we're going to title this The Church of Lively Stones. So watch uh, chapter 2, verse 5. This is the verse we're going to look at tonight. Ye also, I'm going to stop right there because that is so very important. Because whenever I read that, I have to go back and I have to say this. Ye also what? What's Peter saying? What, what is also pertains to you and I? What's, the, what's he saying here? So what's your paper? The words ye also look back to the previous verse. There are three things said about Jesus in the previous verse that are also true of the church and its members. Number one, Christ was disallowed of men, and so are we. Watch this. The word disallowed means disapproved or rejected. This is exactly what was happening to these believers. They were disapproved of. They were hated for their faith and their teaching long before they were blamed for the fire of Rome. And I can assure you this, that the further the world goes, the less believers are going to be appreciated. There will be, there will be less appreciation. And so you, you see it in the world today. I've heard it many times that we who are believers are a hold up to the rest of society to keep society society can't move forward because we hold things up because we stand up against homosexuality and we stand up against abortion and because we do that and we push back against those things we basically hold up the advancement of society so we basically you could say this are disapproved and rejected number two a very interesting statement that we've talked about many times chosen of God watch uh, verse 4 let me read verse 4 and then we'll get to the paper to whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed indeed of men that was Christ was disapproved of rejected by men but chosen of God chosen of God and and that's the idea here so are we but let me let me get you let me break this down for you the church is the bride of Jesus which God chose to have before the foundation of the world. And I'm not going to go real deep into this because we've talked about it many, many times, but it's good to be refreshed on it because if you get away from it too long, then you tend to forget. But Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, they say this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will now let me just explain something then we'll get back to the paper whenever it says according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world it's not referring to individuals be careful it's referring to the body of Christ before the foundation of the world, God predetermined, predestined that there would be a bride for his son, that there would be a group, there would be a church, there would be a body. And he predetermined that. Now the invitation is to whosoever will can come. It's not that he chose some before the foundation of the world to be saved and others he chose to experience the fires of hell. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The Bible teaches that God is not willing that any should perish. So if, you're, if somebody's going to take that and say that that refers to individuals and that some were chosen for eternal life and some were not, then you got to say that the Bible contradicts itself. And it doesn't. It doesn't. But it makes sense when you understand that before the foundation of the world, God chose to have a bride for his son. He chose to have a church. And so in that sense, when we become, when we accept Christ as Savior, we are part of the chosen in the sense that we are part of the church. Watch the line on your paper. God chose to have a bride for his son before the world began, and whosoever accepts Jesus Christ as Savior becomes a part of the chosen church. 
Okay, so that helps you to understand what a lot of people get distorted. The next thing that it, that's referred to in verse 4 is that Christ was precious. Watch your paper. The word means held in high honor or prized. The church, when he says ye also, he's saying the church is precious to God because for all eternity, watch this, we shall magnify the grace of God. We've talked about this before. But listen, okay, so bring this back to these people and what they're going through. And so they've been rejected. They've been rejected. They're being persecuted. They're, the, they're the, looked at as the low life of society, the outcasts of society. And the words, ye also. What, a, what, an, what, a, what an inspiration to these individuals. Just like Jesus was disapproved of men, so are they. So they are, they're in good company there. Just like Jesus was the chosen of God, predetermined before the foundation of the world that he would come and he would die for the sins of all of mankind. In the same sense, because we are part of the, the church, we too are considered to be the chosen in that sense. We're part of that group. And now, precious, prized by God, rejected by men, rejected by men, looked down on by men, but the prize of God, the trophies of God. Watch Ephesians 1, 5 and 6. It says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved we are accepted by grace but notice verse 6 that we are to the praise of the glory of his grace in other words because of what we were and who we are today because we are royalty we belong to the family of God. We have been forgiven. We carry within us the Spirit of God. We, we, we can then be Christ to a lost and a dying world. And so God has turned our lives around, made us completely new creations. So for that reason, we are to the praise of the glory of His grace because it's all grace that's done it. It's all grace. A couple of my favorite verses too, Ephesians 2, 5-7. through seven says, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you're saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Watch this statement. That in the ages to come, that in the ages to come, throughout all eternity, okay, throughout all eternity, through the kingdom age, and on into the eternal state, through the, that in the ages to come, watch this, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. What's he saying? He's saying this. That in all the ages to come, in that kingdom age, and in that eternal state, you and I will be the trophies of his grace, and we will show forth the riches of his grace through those ages for all eternity. We will manifest the grace of God for all eternity. I, when we studied this, I told you something. That creation today, God's creation today, whenever you look around, you know, I, I, I looked at some of the sunsets that were, that, were, that were posted online from up at camp, and they were absolutely spectacular. And, and you look at those sunsets, and you say, wow, you know, God is so great to create this world and then you have those sunsets and you look around and you see the animal kingdom and you look at God's uh, masterpiece and that is mankind and, and, and you say all of this all of this basically shows forth the almighty power of God because God spoke it all into existence and so it shows forth the power of God but in eternity something even greater than creation, that's you and I, will be on display for all eternity to show forth the riches of his grace. So with all of that said, I say this, don't ever let anybody tell you that you are worthless. Don't you dare. You are precious to God. That's what this says right here. Ye also. 
Just as Jesus is precious, you and I are precious to him. And we will be the trophies of his grace throughout all eternity. You know, we've talked about this before too, that uh, whenever you look at the Jewish wedding and, and whenever that all took place, that when the bride and the groom went into the bridal chamber, the bride was always veiled. Nobody could see who she was. Today in the world, we are, we are the, uh, the bride of Christ, and we are veiled in the sense that the world doesn't realize who we are. They don't realize. But after seven days in the bridal chamber, the bride would come out, the bride and the groom would come out, and the bride would, well, she would be the wife then. She would remove the veil, and everybody would know who she was. After seven years in heaven, while the tribulation is going on here, after seven years in heaven, just like seven days in the bridal chamber for the Jewish wedding, seven years in heaven, and then in Revelation chapter 19, we come back with him unveiled. And then the world will know who we are. Right now, we are veiled. The world does not understand. They don't understand the significance of the church. They don't understand that right now, because of the presence of the church, the demonic forces and the evil of this world is being held back. They don't know that. They don't understand how significant we are, that we are children of royalty, that we are children of God. They don't get that. But there will come a day. There will come a day whenever, they, whenever the world will understand that. And so I say all that to say this, and it's what Peter is saying to these people. Look, you may have been, you may have been disapproved of by your persecutors you may be looked down upon by your persecutors you may be considered the low life of society by your persecutors but not by god you are valuable you are precious you are considered the chosen of god that's true of you and i and so don't ever let anybody tell you that you're worthless don't ever do that don't let them do that because you in god's eyes you are precious let me come back to this paragraph Getting back to 1 Peter 2, 5, the words he also would be comforting to Peter's readers, just like Jesus, they were disapproved and rejected. Therefore, they were in good company, just like Jesus, they were chosen of God in the sense that they were members of the body of Jesus Christ. Just like Jesus, they were precious. They were and will be for all eternity trophies of God's grace. Just those two little words, ye also. Come on back to the verse again, watch verse 5. He also, as lively stones, let's stop right there. That really means living stones, okay? Watch what I have here. Peter tells us that we are lively stones, and the word lively means living. But let us consider the word lively first. This is what the church is to be, lively. Okay, now watch this. We're to be lively, not busy. There's a difference. There is a huge difference. There are a lot of churches that are busy, but they have no life. They have no life at all. They're just busy doing things. That's not the way that we are to be. Okay, watch the next line. We are to be abiding in the vine and bearing fruit for the Lord as a testimony to the unsaved. So when the world looks into the church, when the world looks at you and I, here's what they ought to see. If, if I could use these verses to kind of condense it together. Jesus said, I am the vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Verse 8. Jumping to verse 8, herein, herein, what's he talking about? Herein what? Herein bearing the fruit. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. And let me go back to that verse just for a moment, verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified. And let me just explain that to you. Herein is my Father made known through our lives, through the fruit that we bear, because that, that shows that, listen, I have two grapevines at home, two of them. Okay, one of them is a Concord grapevine. And it is just, this year it's got a, a lot of grapes on it coming 
on if, if uh, nothing gets it, like two little grandsons. Got them all last year before I got to them. On the other side of the grape harbor, I have a white seedless uh, grapevine that is supposed to be outstanding. And I have nursed that grapevine. This is the very first year that it got fruit on it, and I, f grapes on it. And I thought for sure that that thing was done. But let me tell you what those grapes tell me about that vine, that it is alive because it produces fruit. Okay, it tells me that there is life there. Okay, now listen to me. You and I, we, there's a difference in being busy and being alive. Okay, so, so unsaved people can be busy, but unsaved people can't bear spiritual fruit because they are not spiritually alive. You and I are spiritually alive. That's why he says as lively stones, living stones, okay, not dead rocks, but lively stones. And so I connect that with John 15, and I understand then as lively stones and whenever the outside world looks into the church they are to see they are to see you and i as living individuals spiritually living and bearing fruit because that glorifies god and, and by that i mean this it manifests that he is real because from us there is coming spiritual fruit and so that's what they are to see and that's a reminder peter says to these people even that listen to this even in the middle of the persecution even in the middle of the persecution, Peter says, look, remember, you're living stones. You're not dead stones. You're not dead rocks. You are living stones. Okay, let's, uh, let, let me come back. Watch the verse again, verse 5. He also is living stones. Okay, now he's going to continue the thought. Or build up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Okay, so if I were to take the overall view of that verse, here's what jumps out to me, and I'll get to this in a moment, but I'll give you the overall view. When I look at that and I see, and I keep in mind what they're going through and how hard life is for them, and I understand this, that even in the midst of the hardest times in my life, and it doesn't get any harder than being burned alive. It doesn't get any harder than being broiled or being racked or being thrown into the arena with wild animals. It, it, it just it doesn't get any more difficult than that. I don't care what you go through. Nothing we go through, even just wearing out in life, it, it doesn't get any more difficult than this. This, to me, is the max. And in that situation, God accepts, God expects you and I to be offering spiritual sacrifices. Not sitting in a corner saying, woe is me because of what I'm going through, but offering up spiritual sacrifices. You got that? Because that you take what they're going through. You know, I read that letter from Nehemiah, uh, and, and I stepped back a little bit after I read that letter, and I thought, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Because I complain so about things that really amount to nothing. And then I realized as he writes in that letter that there are people in Kenya and, and, and people in Pakistan and, and, and uh, literacy is nothing to those people. That has all been pushed aside. And so now you have all these people that can't even read. And so you can't just go and hand out a Bible to somebody that can't read. It doesn't do them any good. So what do they do? They have to put it all on audio. And they go around and they, from what I can tell, it's like an MP3 player that they hand out to these people. It's like an MP3. Now, there are places where they are writing, they are translating the Bible. Certain books, certain, if you read the letter, you'll find out certain stories. They took, they took significant Bible stories. And they're even using unsaved people to help write the stories. Isn't that interesting? And he, I think if you read the letter, I think you'll find out that as they've, they've used these unsaved people to help translate these stories. But, and what, what happens is these people that are helping that are unsaved, they have to get into the Word and they have to learn the story. Guess what happened? They got saved. 
when they learn the story. But they use those individuals because they need the help. They use those individuals to be able to translate these stories over. And I'm thinking, here we are, and and I can pick this up any time of the day. And I got one on the first floor in the house, and I got one in the basement. I got one at at the chair in my living room, and I have one on the swing in the basement. I have one in each vehicle that I can pick up at any time to be able to read. And I, with that said, I say this. I don't have a leg to stand on whenever it comes to complaining. I don't, that really, think about it. Well, there was people over there on a third wave of COVID. Why have, we, why have we been exempt from that? I have no idea. Why are they going through it and we aren't? I don't know. I don't know that. What I'm trying to, trying to get you to understand is this, that we've never been through what these people are going through. We're, we've never been through what they're going through in India and, and Pakistan and, and, and uh, Kenya or wherever it might be. We've never been through that. But yet, if I get an ingrown toenail, I don't want to offer a spiritual sacrifice. sad, isn't it? To what's the softness of the church. But let me go back to the verse. Let me read it again and get you back to your paper. He also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. We'll just stop right there. Come back to your paper. Peter next reminds us that we are being, being present tense, being built up as a spiritual house. This is speaking of the body of Christ or the church. Let's notice the words of Paul on this in Ephesians 2, 19 and through 22. He says this, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. See what the foundation is? The prophets the apostles, Christ is that cornerstone. We're being built upon that foundation, watch this, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. What's your paper? It started with Jesus, the chief cornerstone, then the apostles and the prophets who made up the foundation, and now us who are the building. The church is currently being built as people are added each day. The church is the dwelling place of God today. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not of your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So, okay, so listen to this. So, okay, you go you take the first part of verse 5 that can take you back to verse 4 and then you understand that we not only are we uh disapproved like christ we're in good company and and now considered to be in the chosen of god because we are of the church and and we are precious and and now he tells us that we are lively stones living stones and now he goes on to say just to remind them you want to know how important you are you are being built up a spiritual house you are god's dwelling place that's what he's saying you are the temple you're the temple watch verse five again he also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house a holy priesthood watch this one not only are believers a spiritual house but we are also a holy priesthood. This is such an encouraging statement. In the Old Testament, now listen, only those of the tribe of Levi could be priests, and it was only the holy or only the high priest who could come into the presence of God once a year. It was on the Day of Atonement. No matter what offering the common man brought to God, he could not enter into God's presence. He couldn't do it. Hebrews 10, 1 through 4 says this says, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never, 
can, could, can and could never with those sacrifices, all those animal sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. In other words, what the writer of Hebrews is saying is this, that with all those sacrifices, no matter what you brought, you could never get into the presence of God. It would never, ever get you into the presence of God. Verse 2, for then would they have ceased to be offered. In other words, if, that would have, if those sacrifices would have made the individual perfect, then there wouldn't have been a need to keep on sacrificing. It goes on, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. There's an interesting thought. When you and I come to Christ and our sins are taken away, they're washed away by the blood of Christ, something different there was a lot different with us in the Old Testament saints, but one of the things that is different is this, that our conscience is cleared. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Just the, that, that the, the guilt is lifted from our conscience. Let me go on. But in those sacrifices, back in the Old Testament, there's a remembrance again made of sins every year. In other words, they, the, the memory of them was still there. It just kept kind of building up. Verse 4, for it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Couldn't do it. So, so in the Old Testament, the common man, no matter, he could bring whatever, whatever sacrifice, the most expensive sacrifice he'd ever want to bring, the, the, the most perfect lamb that, that was ever born to a ewe, and it still wouldn't get him into the presence of God. It, it wouldn't do it. Watch this. With us, however, it is different. When Jesus died, he took our sins completely away. John 1, 29 says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Doesn't cover it, takes it away. 1 John 3, 5 says, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. And then Romans 3, 21 and 22 it says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, watch this, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no righteous. So when you and I get saved, your sin was removed and you were covered. God's righteousness was imputed to you. And so now, in, in, instead of being in your sins, you are covered in the righteousness of God. Watch this. Our sins have been removed, and now we, have, now we are covered in the righteousness of God. Because of this, we can now enter into the presence of God at any time. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession for if we, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of God, confidently under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Watch your paper. Back to Peter. The word holy. Okay, it is a holy priesthood. Not just a regular priesthood, but a holy priesthood. It's a reminder as to how we are, to, we are supposed to live, separated from sin in the world. That's what the word, word means, separated. Separated from sin in the world. Peter now goes on to tell us what we are to do as believer priests. Watch uh, 2.5 again. He also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house. So we are the temple of God. A holy priesthood. So we are believer priests. We can get into the presence of God any time that we desire to offer up here it comes here's the purpose to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted acceptable to god by jesus christ watch your paper we're to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god by jesus christ let us notice that these sacrifices are by jesus christ in other words, these sacrifices are made in the power of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of bringing glory to Jesus Christ and not to us. So it raises the question, what do these sacrifices consist of? What, what do they look like? What, okay, so, so I am supposed to be offering up spiritual sacrifices which are acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. What are they? 
That would, that's my question right away. So I'll help you with this. First of all, what do are, what are those sacrifices consist of? Number one is our bodies. 12, uh, Hebrew, or Romans 12.1 says this, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, that's your whole self, a living sacrifice, holy, here it comes, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's where it starts. Giving our whole selves over, everything, every, listen, giving him every area of our lives, not holding anything back, not holding anything back. Not reserving something in our mind or in a closet somewhere. You know, somebody comes into your house and, and you invite them over and they come over for dinner. And, and you all, I don't know this for sure, but I'm guessing you probably got a room that you don't want anybody to see. And before anybody came, you crammed her all in there probably. And then maybe it's a closet and you're thinking, boy, I hope I don't get a wrong door. And they open that door. One time, I got to say this, because you won't know. But I got invited to a house, and I went in, and the guy said to me, come here, I want to show you something. And, and I've always told people, and I'm not, I am not a house inspector. So if you invite me over and I come into your house, you don't need, if, if there's something out of place, I'm not even going to pay attention to that. That's not why I'm there to inspect your house. So I wasn't there to inspect this house. But they said, come here, we want to show you something. The guy did, the lady was in the kitchen, and she was getting refreshments of some sort ready and so he took me in and he wanted to show me a collection that he had and I had a feeling whenever I was in that room I wasn't supposed to be I wasn't supposed to be and sure enough I was not supposed to be and he got it while I was there and I can imagine he really got it after I left too uh, he got it real gently while I was there uh, so to speak but you know, I say that to say that we, you know, you have those kind of rooms, you know, where you just throw something, hey, so-and-so's coming, throw this in there, you know, and so you cram it in a room. That is not the way that our lives are to be with Christ. We don't cram stuff into a room that we don't want to let him into. He already knows what's in there anyhow. But we are to allow him access to every single area of our life. So that is presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice to him watch number two i got to keep rolling i'm running out of time here's an here's another here's another thing the sacrifices consist of prayers and pray, prayers of praise and thanksgiving and communion with and care for fellow believers hebrews 13 15 through 16 watch this by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice, here it comes, of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So, okay, so, okay, one, one of the spiritual sacrifices is the fruit of our lips. Praise to him, honoring and glorifying him with our lips. But to do good and to communicate, that is to distribute, to share, forget not. For with such sacrifices God is well pleased mm, interesting to do good and to communicate to share to reach out to others those are spiritual sacrifices let me go to number three giving a material gifts to further the kingdom of God Philippians 4 8 watch what Paul wrote he said but I have all and abound I am full having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell, watch this, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. They had given a, they had, apparently they, they had given things or they had given money. Uh, they were things which were sent from you, Paul said. But those things that were given to further the ministry, to further the kingdom were, Paul says, so they were they were they were sweet smelling sacrifices acceptable and well pleasing to God. Let me give you a fourth one. I, w I should have taken more time to speak on these to break them down. Here's another sacrifice that you don't normally think about: brokenness due to sin. Brokenness due to sin is a sacrifice, an acceptable sacrifice. Psalm 51. Before I read this. If you go back and you read all of Psalm 51, you'll find out this is where David's confessing the sin 
with Bathsheba, okay, and, and what he went through and his brokenness. So that's the context of the, of the psalm. But watch what he says, O Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth, and show for, uh, uh, my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. In other words, you're not looking for the, the animals in the burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God, here it comes, watch this, are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, a crushed heart, because this is a, a broken spirit and a crushed heart due to sin, because that's the context of the whole thing. Due to sin, O oh God, thou will not despise. Those are acceptable sacrifices to God. Maybe when we come back, maybe we'll talk more about those. Maybe I'll lap back over those. Conclusion, watch this tonight. Peter is writing to encourage his readers. And in this verse, certain, in this verse would certainly do that. They were reminded that they are lively stones that make up the temple of the living God. They were a holy priesthood, and they have access into the presence of God at all times. They were believer priests who can offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. And I should have added on there, and they were precious. They were precious to God. They were valuable to God. They are his trophies of grace. Sure, they were rejected of men, by men, but not by God, not by God at all. They were precious to him, and so are you and I. And so you keep that in mind as you go through life and whatever you deal with, you remind yourself of this, that, that the words that were written to those readers right there also are written to you and I. And we are the same. We are the same. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Father, we thank you for the encouragement that is here. Lord, there's just bucketfuls of spiritual truth that is here to encourage us. But Lord, in the midst of all of it, I'm reminded that no matter what life throws at us, it is our responsibility to offer those spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable by Christ, that are acceptable to you. So Lord, help us to live in such a way. Help us to give to you the sacrifice of praise. Lord, help us to be willing to distribute what we have to help out when there is a need to be able to further the kingdom. Lord, when we fall to sin, help us to be tender and, Lord, to be of a broken spirit and a contrite heart for those are sacrifices that are accepted by you also. Not to be prideful, not to be reluctant to recognize the sin for what it is, but to repent of that sin. Father, thank you that, Lord, in your eyes we are precious, no matter what the world says, no matter what we face in the world. And there will come a day, Lord, and we look forward to that day whenever for all eternity we will magnify your grace. Lord, thank you for the encouragement. Use it in our lives, we pray. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.